Good evening, family. How's everyone tonight? Good to be in the house tonight. And hello, live stream. Anyone from out there as well? Good evening. Good to have you with us. Hallelujah. Praise God. One, two, three, four. Speaks 
to better words All the empty claims I've heard upon this earth Speaks righteousness for me And stands in my defense Jesus, it's your blood Your blood Your blood Speaks a better word Than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth Speaks righteousness for me
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love.
together with you in the middle, Lord. We are asking for your presence tonight. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Thank you, Father. We glorify you. We magnify you. Thank you.
ask for the Holy Spirit to have his, his, have his way tonight. Why don't we just ask you, Father, you can interrupt this meeting at any time. We're here for you. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Just had this thought just, just go over and over. Uh, and to me, um, new wine does not belong in old wineskins. God wants to break the mold in some areas. There's a newness, there's a freshness. And we've got to be bold enough, brave enough to step where we haven't stepped before. Good. Good evening. Now please have a seat. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just oh. How are we all doing? Good? Awesome. Man, it's good to be back at church. Yeah? Man, it was awesome. We came to the eleven o'clock service, my family. And there were heaps of kids, heaps of kids. It was awesome. It was good to see everyone, good to catch up with everyone. I see some, uh, some of you guys must have come to the morning ones. And so, yeah, no, it's cool. Caught up with a few of you. Haven't seen some. It's Max. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into the notices. All right. Prayer meetings. Yeah. When are the prayer meetings? Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Sunday at 8 a.m. Yes. All right. Church times? Who's got our church times? 9 a.m. is the first service and 11.30 is the second. Ah. 11 a.m. is the second one, all right? And then, of course, 6 p.m. Sunday night. Amen? Amen. Wasn't that a cool... Uh, that, was, that was cool, having the two services. And tonight, man, wasn't the word excellent? I got... Oh, man, that was an awesome word, Pastor Barry. I really thoroughly enjoyed that, and I am looking forward to tonight's. Uh, we've got a uh, youth notice. Lydia. Yay. I forgot I put my name down again. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, so, as most of you will know so far, if you were listening this morning, the Friday before last Friday, we went for a big long bushwalk, and Auntie's legs hurt for a few days after that. <laughs> but we took glow sticks, and it was fun. And, oh, actually, I didn't tell you this, Pat. Josh found a 
great big branch, like that big. And he walked um, before all of us and he was like, I will protect us all. <laughs> so he'd run into the darkness and we just see the glow sticks floating off. <laughs> it's a good time, good time. And so this Friday we're going to be at Mare Park, Mare Park at six o'clock for Capture the Flag. Yeah. And last time we did it there, Someone wound up in hospital, so <laughs> either we won't wind up in hospital or yeah. yeah. <laughs> so either that or um we get to exercise our faith on someone with an injury. So win win. <laughs> if, if you weren't here this morning, the guy that wound up in hospital was on my watch. <laughs> And I would like to apologize <laughs> to absolutely nobody. <laughs> Only one person. I was going for two, so I failed. <laughs> That's the beauty of youth. We always have a good time. We, you know, we're out there doing it. It's good fun. All right, thank you. Uh, 7th of June, we've got Pastor Colin in the house. Amen. <laughs> yes. So that's next week. Next week. Okay. 6 p.m. Oh, awesome. Night service. Come on. Come on. That's going to be awesome. Uh, all right. I think that's it for our notices. Tithes and offerings. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. So we're going to go to Proverbs 3.9. Proverbs 3.9. While well, you turn there, who wants to be prosperous? Yeah. Does anyone want to be prosperous? Yeah. I sure want to be prosperous, and I'm, I'm going to be a bit more bold. Who wants to be prosperous in finances? Yeah. Me too. You know, we sometimes we can have this thought like, oh, maybe, you know, Jesus doesn't, God doesn't want us to be prosperous with finances. That's a lie, and there is a way to do it, and it says it here. <laughs> if you want to be prosperous, here's the recipe. Actually, I'm going to start on five, and I'm going to go down. Trust in the Lord with some of your heart, <coughs> um, all of your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your, th direct your path. So then, let's go to nine. Honor the Lord with your possessions, and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. Does that sound like a recipe for prosperity? I think I heard everyone say they want to be prosperous in finances. It's verses 9 giving you the way to do it. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So if you're, getting, if you're sowing seed, you should repay. If you get a harvest, you should keep it all for yourself, right? No, what should you do? Sow some more so that your vats will be full. And the, what does it say here? And your barns will be full with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. See, we're going to have times. So we've just been locked down for eight weeks. So I'm going to be real, real honest. We've been practicing our tithes and we tithe and we, we give and that's cool. And God blesses us and he blesses the tithe. He does. Yeah. All right. And there were some, some things too, like we were a little bit unprepared with our seed. We sow seed. But sometimes we can hold on to some seed too, which should have been sown. And so when we find ourselves in an eight-week lockdown, you know, you're going to figure out if you've been sowing some seed or not. So we were a little bit off when I kind of think back on my eight weeks. We were still well blessed. We got well blessed. But moving forward, this is how we're going to keep prospering, okay? We're going to gain from our harvest and we're going to sow some seed from our harvest. So where do you sow to? You know, the Bible says that you, you, you sow who, who the Holy Spirit leads you to sow to. If you want to sow some seeds, some good people to sow to, and the Bible says the people that feed your spirit. People in this house, our leaders, our pastors. Yeah? So if you're thinking, where do I sow? Man, well, you can sow whatever. We've sown feed yours, we've sown oranges. And you know what that does? It reaps more because what the Bible says is uh, 
when you when you sow seed, you reap uh, posterity. So posterity is future stuff. No posterity. My wife's <laughs> my wife's trying to. <laughs> it's posterity, but that means that uh, you're getting your you're setting yourself up for the future. And see, that's how God works. He's going to give you the now, and you prepare for the for the future. So you start sowing your seed, and you're gaining your posterity. Fijoas, money, oranges, you name it, you sow it. Amen. That's the recipe. Praise God. Well, I thank you, Father, for all the sowers in this house. I thank you, Father, for the tithers. Oh, Father, that you will protect all the tithers. And that the people that are sowing seed will gain much in their harvest. Ooh, an overflow. I'm going for an overflow. <laughs> I'm going for that overflow. Thank you, Father. And we glorify you with it. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, ushers. Thank you, ushers. Oh, well, we've got Pastor Barry again tonight. Yes. Come on now. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Pastor Barry. Yeah, just keep it there. Sweet, bro. Thanks. Yeah, I'm with uh, Karen this morning. It was so awesome seeing a whole bunch of kids in the second service. Like, probably half of everybody in here was, were, were kids, and that was awesome. That was, praise God, that's fantastic. So first, before we start, um, who here is responsible for this weather? Who's been praying for rain? Yeah. You have. Yeah, you guys have. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> All right. Just back it down, so praise God. <laughs> yes. I said to my wife uh, as, as we're driving through it, I was like, we can't really pray against it if people have been praying for it. <laughs> it's like, this is, probably, someone's probably, this is probably an answer to someone's prayer. So praise God. <laughs> Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for this time together, Lord. We thank you as we break open the bread of life. And Father, I count this as an honor and a privilege, Lord, to, to feed your precious sheep. And Father, we just thank you right now, Lord. I, I stand amongst giants, in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. I stand amongst good boy spirits. And Father, I just praise you. I magnify, I glorify. I thank you for uh, a revelation, Father. Thank you for wisdom. Thank you for your Holy Spirit to come and, and uh, lead us and guide us into truth. And uh, Father, we just thank you that as the seed's been sown, Lord, it's going to reap some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold return. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. God bless you. Hallelujah. So, praise the Lord. We're up to uh, part four in a series, How God Uses Crisis to Reveal His Glory. Who's been enjoying it? Has anyone been watching the, the first three parts online? Um, praise the Lord. It was amazing. When I sought the Lord, the Lord was kind of right there. I don't know how the other um, ministers of the gospel felt, but uh, whenever I prayed to God, um, I usually I, I, I pray to the Lord, I go, Lord, what do you want me to say to the sheep? And uh, you, you're trying to hear from heaven. But I was like, uh, during the lockdown, I was like, bang, here it is. Cave of Agilum, bam, here it is. The authority of the believer, bam, here it is. God uses, his, uses crisis to reveal his glory. And so uh, that's a blessing, man. I was blessed. So... Praise the Lord, we're up to part four in how God uses crisis to reveal his glory. And uh, as we discussed before, crisis can happen on many levels. Crisis happens on many levels. Uh, it can happen internally. It can happen within us. We can have internal crisis. Uh, immediately, so we're kind of moving a little bit more out now, immediately amongst family and friends. Crisis can definitely happen with the family. Praise the Lord. And so uh, um, that, that there is, is, is another level. Um, crisis can happen uh, amongst a community. In a community. Crisis can happen in a community. Uh, crisis can happen nationally. Nationally. Cyclone Bola, when that came through here in the 80s, um, it, was like a, it was like a super storm. Because they had two cyclones, one traveling in from, uh, I believe, the northeast, one coming in from the west. And as they came over New Zealand, they interlocked and created a superstorm. Cyclone Bowler was a superstorm. 
And so that's a national crisis. It's a national crisis. And of course, globally, crises can happen globally. They don't usually happen very much. Uh, the world wars can be considered a global crisis. Um, the pandemic that we've just come through now is, would be considered a global crisis. Um, and so uh, crisis can happen at many levels, but it's no matter what level, God can use it to reveal his glory. He can use it to reveal his glory. Um, and the word glory, of course, if you look at the original um, Hebrew, it's the word kobod, which is abundance, multitude, reputation, splendor, or majesty. Abundance, multitude, reputation, splendor, or majesty. <clears throat> and a, a, a great example of this would be um, uh, Joseph. When I mean, Joseph was sold into slavery of his brothers, and then the Lord delivered him, and made him prime minister of Egypt. Imagine, I would like to actually be there to see his brother's face find out that the, the person that they're standing in front of, the prime minister of Egypt, was the little bro that they sold ages ago. It's like, oh man. <laughs> Rot row. We're in for it now. But he says... Joseph looks at his brothers and says this, look, what, you, what was meant for evil has turned out to be good. God revealed his glory in that situation. Praise God. And what was awesome about Joseph is that Joseph, uh, even though he was under the, um, the Pharaoh, he, he excelled in stewardship. To this day, we don't know how or we can't keep grain for seven years. But Joseph did it. It kind of reminds me of, has anyone here seen Charlie in the Chocolate Factory? And people were saying, and they were talking about his reputation. He goes, man, he could create ice cream that you could leave out in the hot sun all day and it wouldn't melt. But that's impossible. But Willy Wonka did it. <laughs> and in the same way, Joseph did it. He, he, he did the impossible. He was able to somehow keep grain and seed, and supplies for seven years in ancient Egypt, out of all places. And so this reputation went out. This reputation went out. There's as, as, as a glory that came out from that. Praise the Lord. And so when, we, when it comes to crisis, crisis can, can, God can use crisis to reveal his glory. Now, uh, internally, I just want to use myself as, a, as an example here. Uh, internally, at one season in my life, I got stuck in habitual sin couldn't see out of it. And every time I came in here and sat down in the pews, I was thinking, oh, God, I don't know what I'm doing. I can't, can't seem to get out of it. And uh, I remember the Holy Spirit was moving powerfully amongst people here, and I felt the Holy Spirit on the inside of me says, you need to go up for, for some prayer. And I said, yeah, okay, this is it. Um, pastor's going to call out, <laughs> call me out, and, and uh, he's going to, you know, you hear in the Bible about being disciplined and rebuked and, you know, and all the good stuff, and I was thinking, this is it. Here we go. And so I, I came up here and I was ready for it. I was ready to be growled and disciplined. And as the pastor comes along, he, he puts his hand on me and he, goes, and he says, I feel like this is what the Lord's saying to you. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. And it was like a... Uh, a grace came out, an empowerment came out, and you say, you know what? I can get rid of this. I can put this thing off. And so God used that crisis in my life to reveal his glory to me. Powerful, man. Powerful. Uh, immediately, I remember when I first came, <laughs> first came here to, to Rhema Family Church, my family didn't want me to come here and be part of the, the happy clappies. <laughs> didn't want me to be part of the Pentecostal charismatics. Yeah, man. We were Catholic through and through. Quote, unquote, even though my family just sent us along. We were Catholics. And so I, there was a decision that had to be made. And I said, you know what, Lord, I will disassociate myself. Put you first. Lay it all down. What do you got for me? 
And, uh, and praise God, as I began to grow in the things of the faith, uh, you know, I, I don't know how my family was feeling about it at the time, but they could see the change that God was having on my life. They could see that I was becoming more stable. I was becoming grounded in some principles. And I became stronger. And then they began to ask for my advice on some things. And, um, and my, mom, my mom sat with me one time and says, you, know, you are so strong. I've never seen somebody so strong. And uh, praise God. And there was a time in here where I was ministering the word and I put out a salvation call. And I think there was one person that got saved that night and that was my mum. A glory came out of that immediate crisis. Praise God. A community crisis. I remember when I was in Wellington, um, the white power moved down the road. <laughs> They moved down into this thing. That could be a community crisis for lots of people. They have gangs moving in next door or whatever. But God can use that to bring about a, His glory. Uh, nationally, even right now, the passing of corrupt laws. There's some stuff that's been going on and they've been covering it up and hiding it that is just outright ungodly. But what the flip side of that coin is, is that what it's done is that it's brought about a unification of the church. They're able to gather the saints together. It doesn't matter if we're word of faith or we're of this other branch or we're of this other kind of faith. People are coming together and say, look, put our name down on this letter. I got a, 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 an email from Pastor Peter Mortlock of City Impact Church. And, um, and he says, look, if you want to, you can put your name down. I says, yeah, put my name down. Harry Dunn, Rama Family Church. And so our name was, was on the letter that went to, went to Parliament saying, you need, a, you need to uh, uh, release us. You need to let the people go, Pharaoh. <laughs> you need to let the people go. And so, um, praise God. But there was a unified. That wouldn't have happened if crisis wasn't there. If crisis never came, then we'd still be in our own separate Bubbles, <laughs> I'm starting to get over that, <laughs> using the term bubble. We're all in our own separate kind of churches doing our own thing without even kind of looking and glancing at each other until crisis comes. So there is a unification of the church, praise the Lord. And obviously the globally pandemic, God uses his glory, praise God, uh, just calling people around and people just saying, look, this has been an awesome time. We've just seen nothing but increase in God. We've experienced good health. The trees are making more fruit than we've ever seen them before. And uh, uh, God reveals his glory amongst the people. Praise God. And so what we've been also been looking at is the, uh, the church right now lies within seven states or conditions. I've never seen this before I, I started seeking the Lord about this series. The church lies within seven conditions or seven states right now. The loveless church, the persecuted church, the compromising church, the corrupt church, the dead church, the faithful church, which is one of the two good ones, and the lukewarm church. And so what we can do is that we can pull out any church in the world right now and fit them into one of these categories. Some of them could even probably fall into a couple of the categories. But five out of the seven of the churches listed here in Revelations 2 and 3 need to repent. There is this time allocated for them. And true repentance will make the necessity of crisis void. What do I mean by that? True repentance will make the necessity of crisis void. Now, I just want to clarify that crisis will come to everybody. Crisis comes to everyone. It says this in Matthew 5, verse 45. I'll just read it to you. That you be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. And so when crisis comes, crisis affects everyone. But the necessity of crisis for us to turn us back to God is void. 
it's good when the crisis comes that we're already in him and be found to be one of the faithful ones. You understand what I'm saying? Because it's a great position to be in, is that we are already in him, therefore. Now, some of the examples we looked at is, number one, of course, is Israel under Egypt. Um, of course, with Joseph, um, a king of Egypt rose up. He didn't even know Joseph. Forgot about him. Joseph who? And, uh, and, and so he, he, the, the crisis came, national crisis came, um, uh, because Israel had forgotten God. And so God in his infinite wisdom sends Moses, Moses, and the Lord delivers him through Moses. And, um, and so when we looked at, at, at Israel as a people of God, they fitted into a number of states here. They, they fitted into the compromised church, where they, they, they were happy where they were at. They had forgotten about God. They had forgotten that they were the people of God. It's quite interesting, because when God approaches Moses, and he says, look, I need you to go and, and deliver my people. I've heard their cries. And then he says, well, who do I say sent them? See, we can lose it within a generation. We can lose it in a generation. And so they were the compromised church. They were happy where they were at. They were comfortable. It doesn't matter that false gods and idols were everywhere. It doesn't matter that the Egyptians were ruling over them, that they were in somebody else's land. Until crisis comes. Crisis came. The Pharaoh uh, uh, instructed that the, the Hebrew people will be um, slaves and they, they set taskmasters over them and they set them to work and they had to build these monuments and these massive uh, uh, things. And, uh, and, and, and he went out and, they, and what the word says is that they still grew more. They were more blessed and they still began to, they were still increasing under this hard, this hard labor. And so Pharaoh then says, like, we need to go and kill every male baby. Find them. Destroy them. And that's when Moses was born. And you know the story. They, the mother protected Moses, stuck him in a basket, and sent him down the river and prayed. <clears throat> and so Moses, you know the story. If you don't know the story, um, Prince of Egypt's a good one. <laughs> I don't want to tell the, the whole story because it's not where we're going tonight. Praise the Lord. But the people of God in that situation there, in that crisis, they were, they were a compromised people. And they were loveless. They had forgotten their first love. They had forgotten who they were. They had forgotten who God was. And in their desperation, they cried out. Because even though the people of God can be faithless, God is always faithful. He can't deny who he is. And that's such an awesome thing about the Lord. It doesn't matter how many times we've fallen over and over and over and over again. And uh, he's always there. Turn around and he's there. I've been waiting, waiting for you. And I love what um, uh, the disciple uh, Peter, <laughs> I think it was Peter, he says, Lord, how, how often do I, should I forgive my, uh, my enemies? Seven times? <laughs> Thinking he was super holy. The Lord says this. He says, it's seven times 70. So I calculated that out. That's 490. What happens if they sinned against you 491 times? <laughs> what the Lord was basically saying there is that there is no number of times that you've forgiven. In the same measure that you judge, it will be judged back to you. So if I want to, if I want to uh, uh, reap forgiveness, I sow it. If I, if I want to reap mercy, then I sow it. Ooh. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so they cried out as a sign of, of desperation and they hit rock, rock bottom. And so God, of course, in his infinite mercies, he came, displayed his glory, slapped the face of every God, and like lined them all up, ten of them, 
Go Israel, we're out of here. And so that that reputation, you know what glory is a reputation? Their reputation preceded them. They heard the, the neighboring nations heard that Israel were coming their way and they were terrified. I've got to be honest with you. Imagine if New Zealand wasn't here, but over there in the path of Israel. And because we weren't Israelites. And you heard that, the, look, I've heard that their God goes before them and is crushing everyone. Leaving no man, no animal, no baby, no, no, no lady, no nothing behind. That'll be quite a terrifying thing. So this reputation went out before them and, and everybody was beginning to get into fear because Israel were coming and their God was out in front of them, a, cloud, a pillar of cloud by day, Pull off fire by night. <laughs> that's, that's better than uh, those little gold kind of Buddhas or whatever they, that they used to have in Egypt. Where's your God? Here he is. <laughs> Look, you can knock his hand and the cat goes like this. That's my God. Where's your God? I don't know about you. I, I know who I'd like to be serving. So let's fast forward a few hundred years or a thousand years, and Israel now was under Midian because Israel had did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so what usually happens is that a, a, uh, an opposing nation rises up and puts Israel under. Um, and so the state, therefore, from the, the reason of their crisis or the state of the God of people was corrupt and loveless. They were a corrupt people. They were loveless. So once again... Crisis comes and they're oppressed by a neighboring nation. And oh, Lord, have mercy on us. <sighs> and the Lord is there for them again. Forever faithful. So they ra he raises up another man, name of Gideon. And he delivers them mightily, supernaturally. In fact, out of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of, of Midianites that they had to battle... God only uses 300. And he makes this statement. He says, God wanted it, he wanted it to be clear that it was, they were saved by my hand. I don't want the glory to go to them to say, oh, <laughs> it's because we're mighty, self-sufficient. I say, he wipes out that, tens of thousands of people. No, not them. Any of you who fear, get out of here. So I think like 20 or 30,000 left. 20,000 left only 10,000. And, and the Lord says, this is still too much. And he goes, look, we're numbered like one to 100. Even if one of us took 100 men out each, he goes, no, 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 no. Sieve them all out. And so they did the whole drinking the water thing. And they came down to 300 people. That's it. 300 of them. Perfect. So that his glory can be revealed in this time of crisis. His glory can be revealed in this time of crisis. All right, let's have a look at this other example here. This one's a really cool one. It doesn't really kind of get preached much, but I, when I was doing my uh, Bible in a year, which took about three years, <laughs> I came across this story. I thought this was fantastic. And what, who here has ever heard that if you are left-handed, that's the devil's hand? Has anyone here, has anyone here heard that? It's the devil's hand. If you, were, it's an old saying. Well, for those people, if you're left-handed, and if someone says to you, "Oh, you've got the devil's hand," here's a scripture for you that you can say oh, doesn't mean. I don't know where you got that nonsense from. Judges three, verse seven. Judges three and verse seven. This is a really cool guy by the name of Ehud. He's a judge from the land of Israel. Uh, we'll come in at verse seven. So Judges 3 and verse 7. And so the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Oh, here we go again. You know the meaning of the word kased, which is spelled H-A-S-E-D, is God's relentless love towards wayward Israel. It describes it as it was his consistent and persistent refusal to wash his hands clean from wayward Israel. 
That's powerful, man. Powerful. His cassette love. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. Oh, man. What, is that? what categories do they fit into? The loveless church. They had forgotten their first love. Corrupt. Serving other gods. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan, oh man, Rishathayim, Cushan Rishathayim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served, oh here we go, <laughs> Siyah, they served Siyah, eight years. And when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel. Again, I've added that word again, who delivered them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war and the Lord delivered Siyar, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Siyar, so that the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. All right. So here is it. We, we begin to see a pattern here. Now let's have a look uh, into verse 12. This is, um, this is my man Ehud. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. If you read through this, it's like, oh man, again and again and again, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. It's like, when you, when you see that a king had done right, you right there, Sam? <laughs> when, the, when, the, when there was a king that did right in the eyes of the Lord, it's like, oh, <laughs> relief, praise God. It's like, oh, finally, there's a good king. But there's, only, there's probably a handful of kings that were actually good. In fact, the Lord didn't actually want Israel to be led by a king. I don't want you to be like any other nation. I want to separate you and make you different. But, oh, no, we want to be like the other nations. Give us a king. They've got kings. Give us one. So there's, there, there it is. Anyway, in verse, verse 12, And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. Because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon and Amalek. And they went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Psalms. Of oh, Palms, sorry, in the city of Palms. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. 18 years oppressed. And so what's Israel answered to that? But when the children of Israel cried out, Oh, Lord, help us! Cried out to the Lord. The Lord raised up a deliverer for them. Ehud, the son of Gerar. This guy is cool, man. This guy is cool. He was a Benjamite. A left-handed man. Yay! <laughs> As to you, he thinks the devil's little left-handed men. Far out. Left. What a silly thing that was, eh? He was a left-handed man. By him, the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was a double-edged and a cubit in length, and he fastened it under his clothes on his right thigh. And so he brought a tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man. So we're, we're talking this guy was huge. Like, not just, not, not just like overweight. He was like blubbery, man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he was a very fat man. If the Bible actually points this out... <laughs> The Bible actually has it in brackets and says he was a man, he wasn't fat, he was huge. He was a very fat man. And he was a very fat man. <laughs> oh, mate. Hope I could get through to it. When he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent the people away who had carried the tribute. But he sent himself. Uh, but he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. He said, keep silence. And all who attended him went out from him. Everybody get out. Go away. 
Wait for me outside. I want to hear this. So Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. Then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. Then Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger out from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. Even the hilt went in after the blade and the fat closed in. (laughs) 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 Oh, man. (laughs) And the... (laughs) This guy was huge. (laughs) And the fat closed in after the blade. Like, the, the whole thing just disappeared. <laughs> the whole thing's gone. For he did not draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. Ugh. Then Ehud went out from the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. And when he had gone out, <laughs> Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said... He was probably <laughs> he was probably intending to his needs in the cool chamber. So they waited until they were embarrassed. <laughs> and still he had not opened the doors of the upper room. Therefore they took the key and opened them, and there was their master fallen dead on the floor. But Ehud escaped while they were delayed and passed beyond the stone images and escaped to Syrah. And it happened there when he arrived that they blew the trumpet of the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mountains, and he led them. Then he said to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. Now he was, he, this is the thing about Ehud. He was saying, it's not by my hand, it's by the Lord. Reputation went out amongst the children of Israel. It's not by Baal or Asherah, it's by the Lord. The God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He has delivered us. So this glory went out on the the people, for they knew that the Lord had delivered them. So they went down after him, seized the fords of the Jordan, leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time, they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all the stout men of valor. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. So we can see there is this pattern that happens. Crisis comes. The people cry out to God. God sends them a deliverer. And then there's a good season. And during the good season, they did evil again. And then a a crisis comes. They subdue Israel. They cry out to God. And then God sends them a deliverer. And then the land rests again. There's this good season. You know, in the seven conditions or states of the church, there there are two that didn't have to repent. There was the persecuted church, and there was the faithful church. Now, the persecuted church, this was their instruction. Don't fear, continue to be faithful. Don't fear, continue to be faithful. The faithful church says, hold fast that no one can take your ground. Hold fast to what you're... Because crisis comes to everyone. Hold fast so that no one can take your crown. Now, of course, the best out of the seven churches that I'd like for us to probably be in would be the faithful church. The faithful church. Now, it's easy for people to earnestly repent and humble themselves before the Lord when crisis strikes. Bang. Everything that you kind of were sufficient or leaned against on is taken away and you're at the bottom of the, of the pit. And that's, it's easy to turn to God and say, Lord, I need your help. I've got nothing. But what about when times are good? I remember talking to Pastor Colin one time, and um, he he was sharing about how, uh, 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 I think, times where where the church's been persecuted and that kind of stuff, and in the persecuted church, they they turn to God, they earnestly seek the Lord. And people that make the decisions for for Jesus really, it's a life or death kind of situation, and they kind of, really make those, those, those calls and they, they make these quality decisions. And I asked him, I says, well, what do we do when, time, when times are good? 
What do we do when the season is well with us? See, when Israel experienced times of rest and peace, they had the tendency to be led astray or slip back into habits. And sometimes they'd straight out rebel. It seems when there is idleness, foolishness is around the corner. It seems when there is time of idleness, foolishness is around the corner. And so how do we keep strong in the faith during the good season? Because this was a real question I had to ask. And even as a, a, when, we, when we took over pastors of, of, of this church here only a year and a bit ago, the church as a whole was in a, in a good season. They were comfortable. The Western church, of course, they were well off, much better than the persecuted church in, in other nations. We live here in New Zealand in the land of plenty. We are blessed to be in this land. None none of our children are starving. We don't have to believe God for for food for them. Like they do in, in other nations. So how do we make our how do we hold fast to our faith? Or or how do we sincerely seek the Lord when times are good? It's the real question. How do we keep ourselves from being led astray? How do we make the necessity of crisis void? We can't stop crisis, but we don't want to be depending on it for us to really kind of turn and seek the Lord. So I've compiled... Just a little short list here. How to keep strong in the faith during the good season is number one, don't forget your first love. Number one, don't forget your first love. Relationship with God the Father is all that matters. I was reminded of this last year at ICFM. Fergus McIntyre, I've shared this many times, but even whenever I think back about it now, I'm just, it's hard to kind of describe what it was like. The man of God, he's quite a large guy. He was just sitting kind of where where Karen was. We were sitting over there in the back. And uh, someone came up and and, uh, I think Tom Engels just shared the word and and, uh, he he spoke some prophetic stuff over us, that kind of thing. And that wasn't it. It was great. We received it. Praise the Lord. But Fergus McIntyre stands up. I think he just g- he gave a prophetic word as well. He, he just you know spoke some things over the people here about what you know what's coming up and stuff. And then he, he sits back in his seat, sits down over here. And um, I think they you know they're about to close the meeting. And the, the worship team was up, was getting up, ready to lead us in some worship. And he walks towards the altar. He goes and he he, he cries out. He, he, he reverberated some noise. There weren't even English words. Now the the word talks about the groanings in the spirit. They were like they were they weren't utterances of of legible language as such. In fact, uh, um, when the servants came for Jesus and says, "Look, Lazarus is dead," there he Jesus himself groaned in the spirit. And uh, when, I, when I researched that word in, in the Greek to see what that, that word groaned means, it, it said it was like a snuff. <laughs> it was like a snuff, like a horse, like a <laughs> in the spirit. But at that moment when Fergus McIntyre, he, he let out, it wasn't like a, <laughs> it was like a, he let out this kind of cry, he cried out. And honestly, it just went out like a laser and and just struck probably half the meeting. And it was something that hit me right in the spirit, man. And I was reminded again of what actually matters. And it's His presence. It's not about my ministry or it's not about uh, 
uh, uh, the works that need to be accomplished. It's not about revival. It's not about uh, any, it's not about all this kind of outer external stuff that we think about. It's about him here and here. Nicodemus came to Jesus one time and he says, look, I wasn't Nicodemus, I was a teacher of the law. What is the, what is the greatest commandment in the law? I'm trying to test him. Jesus didn't, didn't answer it for his, for his answer. He, he answered it for, for us now that we were able to read it in the word, but he also answered it for those who are listening. The greatest commandment in the law, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul and with all your mind that is the first and the greatest commandment your relationship with him is what counts most even if you don't know where you're going uh, uh, in your call of God for your life even if you don't know the answers I sought the Lord during COVID lockdown and thought Lord I need some leading for the people right now what do I do because I have no idea this is what he said. Keep hold of the hem of my garment. That's all that matters. Hold on to the hem of my garment. And that's where he wants us to be. Positioned right behind him. Blessed is the man who is anointed with the flakes of his rabbi sandals. An old Jewish saying. I'm right behind him in his presence could feel the heat off his body could feel the turns of where he wants me to go could feel him stop and wait for a while and rest could feel when he's about to get up and go again If you want to know what success in life is in, in walking with God, I just showed you it. Don't forget your first love. Number two, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. So don't forget your first love, but fear God so that there is no compromise or, or uh, anything corrupt come in. Now, to fear things is wrong. Fear of men is wrong. Fear can rob you of your destiny, and we know that from uh, uh, Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? God had to go and find him. He was hiding out in a cave somewhere, running from a woman. <laughs> Jezebel. And he says, look, I, I, uh, I've killed everybody. I'm the only one left. What are you doing here, Elijah? Oh, we killed everybody. Okay, all right. The job is half done, and you obviously can't have the fortitude to kind of pull yourself together and carry on with it. I'm going to anoint three other people to finish what you were supposed to do. So he lost his destiny, and he had to kind of anoint other people to carry it on for him. So fear of things is wrong. Fear of men is wrong. Fear of this pandemic was wrong. The war that we, you took upon uh, wasn't on people, wasn't on the World Health Organization, it was on fear. And fear wasn't going to rob us of living life, even in COVID-19, even in lockdown. Yeah, we listen to what the government had to say. Yeah, we can stay in, it, in our thing, but we're not going to get into fear about it. Because Psalm 91 says in my Bible that pestilences and plagues will not come near, near my dwelling. Hallelujah. But the fear of God is good. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I know a lot of people say this, This is the difference between the fears. Well, you fear things and you fear God. Fear God is like this reverential respect. It's kind of more than that. Because when I, when I broke the words open and had a look at them, the words are different in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew texts. But the fear of God 
and, and they're very similar. And they both talk about terror. You are in absolute terror of God. Turn with me, please, to... Uh, I just want to give you this, put it in context. Exodus 20, and verse 18. Exodus 20 and verse 18. used this a, a number of times. This is a great scripture, and this, this kind of illustrates it perfectly. 20 verse 18, Exodus 20 and verse 18, it says, Now all the people were there, this is the Israelites, witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Now we can kind of think, well, it's just God. Why didn't you guys enter in? <laughs> He wants you to come into his presence. Uh, I've seen, um, I can't remember where it was. Where was that eruption? Was it in the Philippines? This volcano erupted in the Philippines, and the, these people managed to get a wedding photo in front of it. Well, it was full on like... <laughs> but within the cloud was uh, this amazing lightning display. It was on the news. It was just going... <laughs> it produced like these lightning flashes. This thing was terrifying, but at the same time, it was beautiful. Now, could you imagine that times 1,000, where God descends upon the mountain? Thunderings, lightning flashes, the sound of a trumpet even. <laughs> Mountains smoking, when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then, Moses, then they said to Moses, oh, We ain't going in there. You speak with us and we will hear. But don't let him speak, because we will perish. We will die. Moses says this. He said to people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. Don't fear the thing. The lightning flashes, the thunderings, the clouds. But fear him, himself, the holy God. And so what we see here is that, is that uh, uh, the wrong fear the fear of things leads to self-preservation. They're like, oh, no, I don't want to get in there just in case I perish. But that his fear may be before you leads to self-sacrifice. Like I was talking about this morning. Self-preservation versus self-sacrifice. Jesus says this, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever decides to save his life, self-preservation will lose it. You know, people that are out for themselves have lost life. Self-seeking, selfish, building themselves up. They, they don't want to. They don't want to hurt themselves. They lose their life. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Here's a quote from the movie Braveheart by William Wallace. If you're not willing to die for something, then you're not really living at all. If you're not willing to die for something, then you're not really willing, not really living at all. So that's number, that's number two. Fear God. So number one, don't forget your first love. Number two, fear God. Number three, put off works of darkness and put on light. We know where the scriptures are. Romans 13 verses 11 to 14. We've covered that before just quickly go through this so put off works of darkness and put on light number four pursue the spirit pursue the spirit turn with me to Galatians 5 real quickly I'm going to come in at verse 16 Galatians 5 so we're trying to learn how to keep ourselves when the, se when the season is good because we can get a little bit lazy sometimes 
When we're in need and stuff, it's real easy to depend on God and believe in God and believe in God and I need you to come through. And you're, 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 you're consistently thinking about Him. But when things are good, like I, I'm trying to prepare you for when the church enters into its glorious state, where there is multi, multiplication happening, an increase in your life. Not to be deceived by the things that you have. Because when you increase in stuff, it's easy to just say, okay, God, I don't need to press it into you as much anymore. Kind of sort it out. Galatians 5 and verse 16. It says, As I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish but if you are led by the Spirit, if you're hanging on to the hem of His garment, then you are not under the law. Verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which is adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like, which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is this, is love. That is, the Spirit, that is the fruit of the Spirit, is love. All the other words that come after it is a description of what love is. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. You have lost your life for the Lord's sake. But if you live in the Spirit... If you are alive in the Spirit, then let us also walk in it. Walk in it. Hallelujah. It's a shame when, when people kind of get quite successful. And they know some things. And they see the kingdom work in their lives and they've re reaped harvests. And then they kind of turn from pressing into the Lord. Stop operating in the kingdom. What do I need to sow? I've got all that I need. Which leads to the fifth and the last point. Watch over self-sufficiency. Watch over self-sufficiency. I love what Kenneth Hagin says. When I, got, when I pressed into the kingdom, when, I, when we, we did the kingdom series, the kingdom of God, Kenneth Hagin said, said this outstanding statement. This is Kenneth Hagin Sr. He says that God is not against you having things. He's against things having you. you go. He's not against you having things. He's against us coveting things. And we, you have to kind of, there is a real thin line there when you sow for things. Like, it'll be wrong for me to sow for a, a, a house, for an example, or maybe I'm sowing for a, uh, a car, or so for, <laughs> you know, when, I, when I'm, I'm going to believe God for an airplane one day. <laughs> and you know what? I've already booked myself a pilot. One of my former students, um, they used to go to Mangakahi Area School, his name's Adam. Uh, he comes from our Pupiwo. We sat, I sat with him when he was a student at, at Mankai Area School. We looked at his credentials and I said, okay, let's, let's have a look at your credits in this computer system. And it spits out all the possible jobs that he could pursue based on all the things that he was good at. And one of the things that he was good at was, was an air pilot, was a pilot. And I go, do you want to fly planes? He goes, yeah, I want to fly planes. So sure enough, he pursues that as a, as a, a career for his, for his life. And now he's a, uh, he's a qualified pilot. He's come back, and I saw him down in the gym one time. I said, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, I'm just, you know, just taking a bit of time. Uh, and I said, so can you fly like commercial airplanes? And he goes, well, yeah. But I still have to sit this kind of two-year probationary kind of period. Uh, I think it's like a, um, you know, one of those things where before you kind of become fully qualified. Um, and I said, look, I'm a senior pastor right now. And in the times to come, I'm going to... Uh, he asked me heaps of questions about it. And I said, I could prob we'll probably be flying around the world and, and ministering the gospel. He goes, oh, yeah? 
I'm down with that. He's not even saved. <laughs> he goes, let's fly around the world and, and, and preach the gospel together. <laughs> But it'll be wrong for us to kind of, it'll be wrong for me to kind of take that plane and, and kind of uh, uh, covet it. Where I begin to lose focus on everything that matters. The call of God on my life. People. People is what matters. And begin to kind of, yeah. <laughs> And covet things. When you, when you believe God, because here's the right way of doing things. When you believe God and you sow towards something, you can, you can believe God and say, I thank you for that. And then just let, let the kingdom do its thing. Don't speak against your seed. You know it's going to come anyway. And then just carry on with what God has for you that day. And let tomorrow worry about itself. Well, today has its own worries. And let's deal with this with the Holy Spirit together today, each step. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you, can you see the difference there? I don't want to get people to get hung up on this. So being watchful over self-sufficiency. Revelations 3 and verse 15, I think I can't describe it any better than this. So we'll let the word speak concerning self-sufficiency. Now this is um, uh, the church of Laodicea. Church of Laodicea, known as the lukewarm church. Verse 15, it says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either refreshing and cold or nice and hot, like a cup of tea. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you from out of my mouth. It's because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. You've become self-sufficient. Do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich and the white garments that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with an eye salve and that you may see as many as I love I rebuke and chasten therefore be zealous and repent because I stand at the door of your church and knock and no one is letting me in we have need of nothing Now, if we come to that place, because start, they start off real well. Look, I know your works. <laughs> I know you do, do good stuff. But you become self-sufficient. I wonder how many churches would actually judge themselves by the prosperity that is flowing it through their hands. Well, we must be doing something right. We've got flash cars sitting out there in the parking lot. We've got a brand new auditorium that's just been built. Praise the Lord. God has blessed us. We don't have need of anything. But you are. This is what the Lord says. But you do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind? It's easy to press into God the provider when we're in lack. But what happens when we're good? I just want you to know that his kingdom is always moving you forward. We should never come to a place where I don't need to believe God for anything. Because the blessing of the Lord says this in, in Deuteronomy 28. It says, look, are you lending? You will lend to many nations. Have we ever come to that place yet? You may have a freehold house. You may have freehold cars. You may not have to worry about some... Uh, mega bulls that are, that are coming up. Praise God for that. But it shouldn't stop you from progressing forward. Never stay still concerning your finances. You need to be lending to nations. That's how far the glorious church, we should be the answers to what the world sorely needs. And they can only come from Him and our relationship with the Lord and working the kingdom. I looked at a, um, a, a statement from Kenneth Copeland Ministries. They released to his partners. 
And they said that they had tithed in one year 10 million plus dollars, which means that 100 million would have came in. But what I've noticed about those, those generals in the faith, they get slanged on every time for making this amount of money. But they don't see the sacrifices that they made to get there. There's been times when Jerry Savelle's family have come home. There's no couches in their lounge because they've sold it to someone. They've given them away. Time and time and time again. They've given, they've given, and they're operating in the kingdom all the time. Sowing, giving, moving forward. Sowing, giving, moving forward. Jesse says he sows uh, harvest now and reaps orchards. <laughs> Jesse the planters. Wife well, was saying that Jesse the planters has sowed everything that he had twice. So they, the kids will come home with nothing, to nothing. Oh, Dad's giving it away again. <laughs> See, right now, even though uh, uh, these men of God are, are well off, Jerry Savelle is still believing God for finances to come through all the time. Because now he's paying off church mortgages. Furthering the kingdom with his faith. Seeking the Lord. That's how prosperity is meant to operate. He will multiply the seed of the sower so that you're able to expand and build the kingdom. There's a warning. Make sure we're watchful over self-sufficiency. We never come to a place where we're not depending on him. Praise the Lord. So let's just uh, sum this up. Number one, don't forget your first love. This is our lessons from these five out of the seven churches here. Don't forget your first love. Number two, fear the Lord. Don't let compromise come in. Fear God. I think the church has a long way to go when we really have this honor and respect that the Lord actually deserves. Number three, put off works of darkness and put on light. Put off works of darkness and put on light. That'll, that'll keep you from being corrupted. You know, I looked, about, I looked at this corrupt church here in, verses, uh, in chapter 2, verses 18 uh, to 29. And it says, uh, and, it, and it talks about sexual immorality. And you can kind of ask the question, well, what if two unmarried people come to church? And they're living together. What happens then? And sinners need to be welcomed here. The best place for a sinner to be is here, amongst the people. They need to know the love of God. I remember that, that, um, that white power member that the Lord got me to minister to. He had 666 and a picture of the devil on his, tattooed on his cheek. And he was afraid of the church. Because they, they wouldn't accept me. I said, well, that's not right. So you come to Rhema. I don't know if I could speak a bone. I was, I was a young believer then. Come to Rhema. He was on his way down to a uh, white power convention, practice witchcraft and sorcery. But the Lord wanted me to minister to him. I thought the fact that God wanted me to reach out to this person who's on the other side. No hope, in despair. And so, what happens when someone like that comes in here? Do we reserve his, his holiness? I just want to enlighten you on some things about God's holiness. God's holiness, he's done everything that he can in order for him to be with real people. It's quite interesting, in Isaiah, for an example, the, uh, a, a, uh, an angel, an archangel came before him, and the Lord was speaking through this angel, and he says, I am undone. <laughs> I am going to die. Because he was looking at his sinful self, and, and amongst a pure being of holiness. And the angel takes a coal, presses it to his lips, and makes him clean.
The only person, or the only thing that can make a person clean again is a touch from God. So we put off these works of darkness and we put on light. We fear the Lord. We fear the Lord. That's where we're at. We fear the Lord. So the fear of God is that we, we honor Him. Us that, knew, that know Him, we honor the Lord. We fear Him. We fear God. Number three, we put off works of darkness and put on light. Praise the Lord. We're graced to do that. And it speaks. When you're able to just shake stuff off, just put this off. Someone, someone does you wrong. Oh, that's all good, man. <laughs> I, put off, I put it off. And you put on light. You speak to that person who offended you. Number four, pursue the Spirit. Walk in this. If you're alive in the Spirit, then walk in it. Walk in the Spirit. And number five, be watchful over self-sufficiency. Be watchful over self-sufficiency. Praise God. Praise the Lord. So that's the word that I had for you today at Pentecost Sunday. So let's have the worship team back. We've still got a few moments. Praise the Lord. Let's see where the Holy Ghost wants to go. Next. 
series a couple of years ago called To Transcend. And so when, when I, th- I think about this and, and think about how do we keep ourselves when season, the seasons and the times are good, it says, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submission to God is powerful. It says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. every time the Lord has come near he says everything right I often look at the at the word and, and every time the Holy Spirit or the, the Spirit of God or God's presence descends everything fits and aligns with the will of God truth it is his presence it's his presence he makes you humble it's him that makes you want to submit when he turns up and and he's standing in front of you
I look silly in front of others.
thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. take some of your pride away it may require you to dance it may require you to put yourself out there people might think some things about you near to me. stuff. 